Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Beginner's Guide to Postgres Performance Management. Today's event is brought to you in partnership with SolarWinds and produced by Actual Tech Media. Uh, thank you everyone for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on the webinar today. We've got a great event lined up for you. We've got uh, lots of demos, uh, really cool content. So uh, you're in the right place if you wanna see something um, really innovative in technology. Uh, from our friends at SolarWinds. Before we get started, I want to uh, first do a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, the few things that you need to know about today's event. Uh, first off, we want this to be educational. We have experts from SolarWinds standing by to answer all of your questions. So use that questions box there in the left-hand side of your audience console and we'll be doing our best to answer those questions throughout the presentation. We'll be queuing up the best uh, questions for a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. So uh, again, ask away if you have a question related to uh, database performance management and SolarWinds experts are here to help. We also have a number of handouts available there in the audience console. We have solutions briefs on database performance analyzer, database performance monitor, uh, DevOps for the database, and why Database Performance Analyzer is a smart investment for your team. Make sure that you download those now and you can check them out after the event. They might not be uh, as easily available as they are now. So go ahead and just click them and they will download to your web browser's downloads folder for later reference. And then finally, we have an Amazon $300 gift card to give away to one lucky attendee on the live event. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found there in the handouts tab. We'll be awarding that at the very end of today's presentation. And now I'm excited to hand it over to today's uh, MC from SolarWinds. That is Mr. Jared Hensel, Senior Product Marketing Manager. Jared, take it away. All right, thank you, David. Uh, I will first start with, I am not a DBA. I was the individual that always installed databases by hitting next, next, next. Um, I was a systems administrator, so that's how I assumed you installed a database. And then I called somebody for technical support uh, when we had issues with the database. But the two individuals I'm gonna introduce next are not, uh, did not install a database that way and they know how to troubleshoot them. So I'm looking forward to hearing their content. Uh, first up, we have Ash. Hey, thanks, uh, Jared. Uh, so I am a advisor sales engineer at SolarWinds, but in a prior life, I was a DBA database developer, many different roles, uh, but really gravitated and loved uh, the whole area around uh, performance. So I'm looking forward to uh, today's session. And then with me, we also uh, have John Tockney. Hopefully, John, I got your last name right. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, and yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm another sales engineer here with uh, SolarWinds. Uh, prior to uh, becoming a sales engineer, though, I worked as a uh, backend developer and DevOps engineer for uh, some years uh, and spent the last six years of my life basically focusing on open source database performance. So this is what I do for a living uh, and happy to, to be here to discuss it with everyone. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, before we begin, we have a quick poll question we'd like to ask is, you know, where is your database? Uh, obviously, this was probably a, uh, a single choice answer 10 years ago. Maybe, well, maybe two VMware and Hyper-V were out. Um, but now we just want to see um, on it if it's a VM, a virtualized, hybrid, container, um, where people are at, because essentially uh, it is, it seems to be changing by the day or, or the year. So, um, but right now it looks like m most of you uh, are, are still an on-premises uh, database solution, which is still common, uh, but then definitely uh, no containerization yet. That's interesting. Um, you know, that, that one seems to be somewhat picking up steam in some segments, um, and then obviously virtualized. I'll, I'll stay here for one more second or a couple more seconds to just let everybody hopefully fill that out. It just gives us better context to, uh, you know, represent some content. What were you going to say? I was just, yeah, pretty good representation outside of the containers. Yeah, yeah, no, a pretty well peanut butter spread. Um, the container one, that, that definitely is more of a, a newer one and much more nuanced than 
you know, obviously I would expect, you know, virtualization to have been next in line because of VMware and Hyper-V and then really kind of see it progress to on-premises or, I mean, hybrid and then cloud as, as the databases move. So uh -huh. pretty, pretty, pretty well what I thought was going to be uh, in the answers. All right. So yeah, heavily on-prem, uh, then with some cloud and hybrid, obviously virtualization, but nobody is, nobody's containerized their environment yet. So uh, with that said, what this webcast is about is the beginner's guide to Postgres performance management. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more organizations move to open source. Um, obviously, this is somewhat driven by uh, economics. It could be uh, that you, your organization is implementing some development and they're familiar with it. It could be that you just have a commercial application that they chose an open source platform. Um, so really, you know, how you, what you look for, what you're trying to tweak and tune. Um, obviously, it's it's different than your traditional Oracle or Microsoft, but again, there's a lot of similarities on how you want to analyze the data, um, things like that. And you just need to be most DBAs or even accidental DBAs. It is best suited for them or their, their skill set to be familiar with other database types and things to be on the lookout for. Again, not being a DBA, I had a ton of database questions that I shrugged my shoulders at and took me uh, a lot longer than it should have to find the root cause of what was going on. So again, you know, what we're going to focus on here is some of the configuration settings, um, you know, things kind of before, even before you start analyzing data, here's some server settings or database settings you want to look at, some background processes, um, and then really, you know, again, navigate towards query workload and indexing, kind of uh, the life cycle of a, a database configuration from, you know, installing the CD. Do they even do that now? I guess downloading it, they don't install on CD anymore, but essentially at the beginning to end. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our experts, uh, John and Ash, and, and let them kind of start on, on the configuration side of the house. Basically, uh, hopefully you've made some of these settings before you even put data in your database or that you can retroactively come back and change. Take it away, guys. Yeah. Uh, so just kind of getting started with the uh, fundamental configuration settings to uh, frame things up here, and of course the the list of config items that we're not or that we're talking about here is not going to be exhaustive. Uh, we're trying to cover the the most common ones, the foundational ones for for Postgres. So if you make sure that you're you're mining the config items that we were covering here in the the webinar, you should be in pretty good shape. Uh, but there's definitely more that we can do to fine tune our databases as we continue to scale it up and and tune it for our workloads. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and start going down down the list here with a little bit of commentary on them. Uh, so most important config, config item for Postgres, I think, is probably shared buffers. Uh, this is effectively the memory cache for the database. Uh, typically, you want to set this to around 25% of available memory on the server. Uh, you can increase that amount depending on the size of your working set. If you can make it all fit in shared memory, then that's obviously a good thing to do. But uh, the general rule that you're gonna find uh, online and around is uh, past 40% of available memory, it's not really gonna be beneficial to increase it beyond this. And the reason why that is, is Postgres is actually pretty reliant on the operating system to do work for it. So rather than trying to manage its own cache, it's gonna rely on the operating system memory cache too. And so when we're adding memory to shared buffers, we're actually taking away from OS resources that the server expects uh, to be doing work for it as well. Um, hey, John, sure this is Ash. Of course, I, yeah, I have to, uh, uh, I always have to interject. And, and the reason why, well, shared buffers, I, I think it is, you nailed it, is one of the most important uh, configuration uh, settings. And, you know, because Postgres is a cross-platform database, and it, as you noted, it relies heavily on the operating system for its caching. Uh, and then sometimes that's confusing because, you know, the shared buffers is duplicating what the OS uh, does. Uh, since caching is managed by both the OS and Postgres. So as you noted, this is why it's, you know, it, to be careful when you're setting shared buffers, uh, setting this value too low uh, may result in thrashing the buffer cache. Uh, you know, resulting in excessive disk activity, in, which will degrade performance. And then if you set it too high, it may result in what I like to refer to as double buffering. And that can also uh, degrade performance. And I also want to point out that, you know, we, as we go through these configuration, and this is kind of a beginner's guide to Postgres, 
Postgres, it comes tuned um, right out of the gate and it's really tuned for availability rather than performance. Uh, and you're gonna hear both John and I bring this up. It's better to always experiment and arrive at a config that's suitable for a particular application workload. And that's gonna be key as we kind of go through all these different uh, parameters. I also wanna point out that um, uh, changing this particular setting does require uh, restarting the database. Uh, so the amount of memory that you allocate, uh, you know, the whole thing gets allocated out of virtual memory when the database starts. So just to point that out. All right, John, sorry about that. Didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, all, all great points. Um, please feel free to continue interjecting uh, along the way, Ash. Uh, and yeah, to your, to your point, Postgres's configuration by default is actually very conservative. Uh, one of the goals of, of the project is to be able to run pretty much out of the box on almost any hardware. So you can run a Postgres database on a Raspberry Pi, for example. Uh, you don't have to, to tune anything out of the box to make it work. It'll just work. Uh, and so if you think about that kind of in the back of your head, right, we are uh, tuning a database at the configuration level that by default is targeting commodity hardware. Very small deployments uh, should work just as well as large ones. So when you have a lot of resources on a server, we're going to have to make some changes in order to take advantage of those resources. Uh, so moving, moving on with our, our list here, uh, the next one on the, the bullet list, uh, effective cache size. This is another uh, related to making sure the system is, is taking advantage of the memory that your server has. Uh, and so for effective cache size, we're going to target around 50 to 75% of the available memory in the server. Uh, an important note for, for this is Despite what the name is saying, it's not going to allocate a, a cache or it's not going to do any kind of memory allocation. Uh, what it's doing is it's telling the, the server's query planner how much memory it should expect to have available for uh, managing the data that the server is storing and, uh, and querying. So the query planner is going to look at effective cache size and say, OK, this is set to you know, some number of gigabytes. That's how much uh, memory I can expect to have available for me to pull data in from indexes and tables. And that's going to impact how the database plans out queries and executes them. Uh, if it's set too low, then the server is going to assume that it doesn't have a large memory buffer to store data in memory. And that's going to change the way that it uh, issues queries. Sometimes it'll make them a lot slower. If you uh, have memory that you can use here, we want to tell the server about it. Yeah, no, absolutely spot on. And that's sort of because, again, it's a combination of the OS and shared buffers, Postgres knows what memory it has, and you have to sort of tell it uh, what is also available. So it can mm -hmm. think outside the box. So, and the other thing that I want to point out that with the effective, uh, when you change this parameter, uh, it doesn't allocate any memory. Um, so, but as you pointed out, uh, you know, if you have it excessively small, it may discourage the planner from using indexes that would in fact uh, speed up uh, a query. All right, yep. back to you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so workmem, this is this is a fun one. Uh, there's not really a hard and fast rule that we can give people to, to use here. Uh, but the important thing to note when we're looking at tuning work memory is what it's going to impact and how it works uh, at the setting level. So what work memory does is it is allocating a buffer that you can use for operations uh, in certain types of queries. And I uh, try to call it a few of them, but it's by no means an exhaustive list. Things like order by, uh, distinct operations, certain types of joins uh, are all going to require and depend on, on working memory. So the parameter here is going to control how much memory uh, the server will, will allocate for such an operation. If it needs more memory than work mem allows for, then you're going to end up generating temporary files. The server will, will write data to a file uh, in order to do the operation rather than trying to do it all in memory. So obviously things have a very big impact on performance. Um, if we can keep all of our operations in memory, then it's going to be a lot faster than having to, to write data out to a disk and then read it back afterwards. But because this is allocated per operation done, it can be hard to predict how much memory you're going to allocate in the server by tuning this. Uh, it's impacted by things like the number of connections that you have in the system and the types of queries that are being issued against the database as well. Uh, one, one nice thing here is that you can set it on a per session basis as well. Um, so rather than uh, setting the default working memory for the server, if you know you have some queries that are going to require a larger buffer, 
uh, you can increase it for just those the sessions that are issuing those queries. Um, but when you're when you're tuning this parameter, what you're going to want to do is look for indications that the server is allocating temporary files during its workload. Uh, and that can be found within the, the PostgreSQL log. There's also some diagnostic tables that will uh, help identify that information as well. And so when you look at them, you see in the log that uh, temporary tables are being created. You can see the size of those tables and increase working memory to, uh, to cover that allocation that's currently using a file. Uh, but again, be careful here because this is probably the easiest parameter to, uh, to misconfigure and end up running into sporadic out of memory issues just because it can be so unpredictable how much memory is going to be used as a result. Yeah, and John, I couldn't agree with you more because you can have multiple concurrent queries running that have different sorts, different behaviors. So the queries on a system can vary greatly. So again, it's really understanding the workload because you might have times where the system is lightly loaded uh, and you have great performance, but then you have different times of day where you have a heavy load uh, and then you start swapping. So to your point, really understanding the application workload, uh, tuning this very carefully, uh, but it can have a big impact on the performance of your queries. Yep. Okay, uh, we'll round up configuration uh, really quickly here and then move on to, to some more interesting areas of uh, the server. Um, maintenance work memory, uh, this is gonna control uh, something a little bit different than the, the general work mem parameter. This is looking at uh, operations like the, the vacuuming process, which we're gonna get into more uh, in a second here, uh, as well as the creation of indexes, altering tables, uh, things like that. Uh, if you have more maintenance work memory, these operations will happen faster. Uh, but of course, it's going to also use up more memory on the server. So that can be a trade-off against uh, memory that's available for handling queries on the system versus handling these background operations. Um, it's important to be sure if you're if you're doing a lot of schema changes, um, you know, creating lots of indexes, doing lots of uh, of alter tables. You want to have enough maintenance memory available so that the system can uh, do those those operations in a timely manner. But in a system that's handling lots and lots of, of queries, we don't want to allocate too much for, for maintenance work because we want that uh, that memory, those resources available for the database to use for actual user-facing work. Uh, and then the last one here, max connections. Uh, this is something that, depending on the, the databases that you're typically familiar with, is going to be a little bit different. Uh, Postgres allocates a connection mapped to a process on the server. Uh, it's not using a, a thread-based model such as MySQL or um, you know, multiplexing uh, connections across a single thread such as other databases. Uh, and that means that more connections to the database can become very expensive very quickly. Uh, the, the rule that I always use for, for estimating this is each connection to the database when it's idle is going to use about 10 megabytes of memory. So once you get beyond a couple hundred connections, you're talking about a serious amount of memory being used just to maintain a pool of connections. Uh, and for that reason, it's recommended to use a connection pooler uh, like PG Bouncer or PG Pool uh, in front of the database to, uh, to handle the larger number of connections you want to give to the system rather than connecting uh, all your different applications directly to the server. And that can make a big difference on uh, performance and resource utilization when you're scaling up beyond, you know, a uh, couple hundred connections for a database. Sweet. All right. Well, th thanks, guys, for some of the kind of pre-connection tidbits and, and, and what we need to be on the lookout for. So now, you know, kind of this next one is the background process. Let's assume, you know, we've done the, the previous slide. We've made our tweaks at our percentages, kind of did some calculations, and now we're actually, um, I guess, you know, using the product and or using Postgres, and, and now what do we need to be out uh, on the look for kind of in an active database, I'd say? Yeah, um, in addition to the the kind of obvious looking at the, the query workload, which we will uh, talk about past this, there are a couple of different things that Postgres is doing in the background. It has dedicated daemons that are uh, running and maintaining different aspects of the, the database's uh, normal operation and health. Uh, so we're going to focus on two here. Uh, one is called the vacuum process, and the other one is checkpointing. So we'll start with vacuum. Um, you don't have to read the, the wall of text here, so uh, anyone who's <laughs> trying to read the slide, don't worry about it. Uh, it's, it's 
there if you want to read it, but we'll try and cover everything that it says uh, verbally anyways. Uh, so if you're not familiar with, with vacuum, basically what it's doing is cleaning up rows that have been uh, modified that are no longer in use in the database. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, when you run an update statement or a delete statement in Postgres, it's not actually going to immediately remove the, the row or a tuple, as it's referred to internally, uh, from the, the database table. Instead, what we're doing is we're marking a field in a header uh, for that row saying, this was deleted uh, in this transaction. Uh, and this is how Postgres implements multi-version concurrency control. Uh, rather than trying to maintain simultaneous views, basically it just says at this point in time, uh, this data is no longer relevant. It's been superseded by another row in the table. Uh, and so that allows the, the system to, uh, to minimize lock contention when you've got multiple transactions uh, looking at different, different views of the, the database. Uh, the problem here is that all of that data that has been, you know, quote unquote deleted is going to start accumulating and we need to have something that goes in and cleans it up. And so the vacuum process is responsible for doing that among other things. Uh, so vacuum will periodically run and take those, those rows that we have marked as deleted and clean them up. Um, basically, it will update the header as well and say, this, uh, this row is no longer visible. Once all transactions that uh, could see a, uh, a deleted tuple have, have concluded, then that's what we refer to as a, a dead tuple in Postgres. And so those dead tuples are marked as no longer visible. Um, that's going to be important for index scanning uh, in the server. When we have an entire page of data that is filled with dead tuples, Postgres is going to reclaim that memory. So that's going to prevent the, uh, the table from growing infinitely. Uh, and then uh, in addition to that, Vacuum will also analyze the content of your tables uh, and look at the, the distribution of data, uh, calculate statistics on uh, the different values that are present in, in columns. Uh, and this is going to be very important for the query optimizer. Uh, we use those statistics to understand you know, whether or not indexes that uh, are defined in the server are going to be uh, effective and efficient for querying the system versus doing a table scan. So when you have tables that are being updated uh, frequently, running vacuum uh, frequently against the table is going to be very important both for performance and also for uh, making sure that the, the tables don't bloat unnecessarily uh, in the system. So it's kind of a uh, a couple of different things that we need to keep track of here. So this ends up being a very important aspect of, of your Postgres's health and performance. Yeah, I, I, John, I couldn't agree with this topic. Uh, I think it's crucial in really understanding it. And some people would even say it's Postgres's weakness because you know sometimes, and I think this is important, especially if you're new to Postgres, uh, you're checking everything, everything seems fine from a vacuuming perspective. Just a term alone when I first heard, you know, it gave me a little chuckle, you know, is that a Hoover vacuum? What does it use? But, but sometimes uh, vacuum, you know, it isn't, it isn't the whole problem. There, you know, there are some cases where even uh, if your vacuum process ran at the earliest instance when it could reclaim the space occupied by dead tuples, as you noted, and it ran incredibly fast, uh, the table would still become bloated. So for example, uh, bloat can be caused by many short queries run, running while one long running transaction remains open and where the bloat is created by a SQL statement that induces scattered updates throughout the table. Uh, you know, by the time the SQL statements finish, the damage is already done. And, and in these cases, you'll want to see what can be done to produce, we call it, uh, Robert Haas had a really good article on this calls it less garbage, <laughs> so it can be cleaned up more efficiently. He gave a kind of analogy of, uh, you know, if you produce, produce a lot of garbage, you don't blame, uh, you know, the company that's picking up the trash. Maybe that's not the issue. <laughs> it's just you're producing uh, too much. So sometimes you want to look at good schema design and good application uh, design as well. Yep, taking care to avoid those really long running transactions, as you noted, that's going to be another important part for performance because it prevents vacuum from running. Um, a, couple, a couple more notes here on, on the vacuum process. Uh, when we're looking at this, the things to keep in mind is the vacuum behavior works pretty well out of the box for systems that aren't being 
uh, updated or having rows deleted from the table, you know, pretty, you know, very frequently. Uh, so if you have a, a mostly read workload, then you probably won't have to, to muck with this too much. Um, and the, the auto vacuum daemon out of the, out of the box will pretty much take care of it all for you. If you do have a workload that is being, uh, updated frequently, there are lots of updates and deletes happening in the system, then you can tune some parameters that will, uh, make the, the vacuum process happen uh, more quickly against tables. Uh, and you can also do some things to make it uh, not run so aggressively too, if vacuum is getting in the way of, uh, of the normal query behavior and taking up too much resources. Um, it's also possible to do these, these same tuning options on a particular table. So if most of your workload is gonna be, you know, read only, but you've got one table that's constantly being updated, we don't have to change the, the global vacuum behavior. We can do it for just that one table that is kind of different in the workload. So we've got a lot of, of fine grained control for uh, determining how vacuum behaves on the server. Uh, and as kind of a closing thought on the, uh, the topic here, uh, paying attention to the, the bolded part in the slide, the answer to vacuuming issues is never gonna be vacuuming less. You should always vacuum, um, almost always vacuum more when you're having issues. Because as, as you noted, Ash, you know, not having vacuum run on the system can cause many different problems. Uh, it's, it's better to let the auto vacuum daemon do its thing than try and turn it off and control it manually where you can get into all sorts of trouble if you do it incorrectly. Yeah, exactly. And, and also just to keep in mind that uh, you can have multiple auto vacuum processes running at the same time. Yeah. Uh, the default, yeah, and it, after 8.3 and higher, the, uh, the default is three processes running. Uh, but you can set your auto vacuum max, max workers as well. And then this also ties everything that John is saying as far as vacuuming also ties into the configuration, the maintenance work mem uh, as well. So wanted to kind of join those two together. Yeah, exactly. If you have larger tables, then a higher value of maintenance work memory will allow vacuum to proceed more quickly. Uh, so that's, that's one of those specific config items that we covered earlier. Uh, one of the reasons why it's so important is because it controls vacuum behavior. So I think that's all I had on, on vacuuming, unless you had any closing thoughts, Ash. No, I think that was pretty good. Okay, awesome. Uh, so we'll move on to, to checkpoints, which is the other, the other fun background operation that I'd love to talk about. Uh, so checkpointing is, is not a, a concept that is unique to Postgres. Um, pretty much every database does this in, in some form. Uh, and what we're doing here is we've got what's called a write ahead log or the wall as it's referred to, that every change that uh, your, your database is making is gonna have written to the, the write ahead log first. Uh, so when I go in and issue a, uh, an insert or an update statement, rather than going directly to the table and making that, that change happen, we write to the wall and say, this operation is happening. Uh, that is done for performance reasons. You can append uh, data to a write-ahead log very cheaply, whereas if you're writing to all these different tables, then you're gonna have a lot of random IO happening in the system. So it's for, for that reason that we, we have this process, as well as for uh, things like crash recovery. Um, the the write-ahead log makes it easier to recover the system when all of a sudden there's an error and it goes offline, like you know, if there's an out-of-memory issue on the server. When the Postgres comes back up, what it does is it reads the data in the write-ahead log and uses that to uh, replay all the changes that happened um, that it didn't get a chance to, to correctly uh, apply to the database. So um, crash recovery and performance are, are the, the two chief concerns of the write-ahead log. Uh, and you've got these, these kind of dueling concerns that you've got to, to manage here. Uh, if your write ahead log is too small, uh, and by that, what I mean is there's a configuration setting for how large it's allowed to get before Postgres does a, a checkpoint and make sure that all the changes in the, the write ahead log have been, uh, made to the server and it flushes it to, to disk. So if the write ahead log is uh, set to only allow a small value, then you're going to have checkpoints. Uh, happening very frequently in the system. And that can be you know, bursts of random IO that are happening uh, on the server and will cause performance overhead for a write heavy workload. Uh, on the other hand, we can't just set the, the write ahead log max size to something huge because 
if we do, you're going to let a bunch of changes accumulate in the log. And if your server does crash, it could take quite some time for the server on startup to process all of those uh, transactions and, and get back into a usable state. So we need to make sure that we're balancing those concerns. If you have a system that um, would need to recover immediately from, from crashes, then it might be better to keep the, the right ahead log buffer small uh, and make sure that uh, we're, not, we're not having too many changes accumulate in the system that it's going to have to process on startup. But if we want to keep uh, post or, uh, performance as our chief concern, then we need to make it larger so that we're not having checkpoints happen so frequently that they're uh, interfering with uh, the server's query workload. Yeah, no, they, hey, John, that's, that's good stuff. And I, also, I want to just inject some good news here because uh, there's so many things that you're keeping track of from a performance perspective. And I also want to tie this back to what we went over with, um, with config and especially shared buffers. So uh, in Postgres, and keep up on your versions with Postgres, they continually add and make uh, improvements. Um, I believe yes. it was Postgres 9.1, wall buffers will auto-tune. Um, and I believe the algorithm uh, is 3% of your shared buffers. And I believe it goes to a maximum of 16 uh, megabytes, which uh, is actually the size of a single wall segment. Uh, go figure. <laughs> so, but, but to John's point, um, even on versions uh, that use the auto-tuning formula, the 3% auto-tuning formula, uh, a higher value, a higher wall buffer value can sometimes improve performance. Uh, especially if you have frequent checkpoints and lots of concurrent uh, activities. So don't be afraid to play around. And again, it all ties back to understanding the application workload. Uh, that's really, really important. In, in both of these cases, for checkpointing and vacuuming, uh, you'll notice that they're really only playing a heavy role here for uh, write activity when you're issuing updates, deletes, uh, and in the case of checkpoints, inserts as well. So again, if you have a system that you know is a uh, read mostly or even read only workload, then guess what? You can skip this part. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And, and, and just so, because this is a be beginner class, I remember when I first started looking uh, at Postgres, um, you know, it's important to look at these settings and you might be wondering, you might be Googling and you can Google each value. Uh, but most of these are going to be in your Postgres uh, SQL.conf uh, settings. So you can also do a, a show all or a show that specific setting to see the current value because you also have to be careful that some of these settings uh, can be overwritten at the session level. So just because you're looking at a configuration file, uh, which is typically going to be located so your Postgres uh, SQL.conf uh, is going to be in your PG data uh, directory. You know, make sure you uh, consider symbolic links, <laughs> though, as well. Um, but you can have these settings that are uh, changed kind of on the fly. So that show all, or you could do a select star from a PG underscore uh, settings. I just wanted to add that since it was a beginner's class. They may not know the specific configuration files where they are. Yes. And actually, that, that reminds me, Ash. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention here for how to track whether or not vacuum and checkpointing are actually causing problems for you. Uh, so if you want to keep an eye on these, there are some diagnostic tables that Postgres provides to make it easier to understand what's happening. Um, first of all, you can, uh, again, look at the, the Postgres SQL log. It will tell you uh, when there are vacuum processes that are happening and completing. Uh, from the auto vacuum da uh, daemon. You can also refer to the, uh, there's a table called PG stat user tables. Uh, that's going to show for every table defined in your database, uh, a number of different statistics about them. Uh, and that's going to include how many dead tuples the table has. Uh, there's a column called uh, n underscore dead underscore tuple. Uh, and that'll tell you there's a lot of uh, tuples that are accumulating in a table that are causing table bloat and could be a potential performance issue, it means vacuum probably needs to be run against that table. Uh, if you see tables that have lots of dead tuples in them, then it might be better to, to tune vacuum behavior for that system. Uh, and we can also separately see how long it's been since the table was vacuumed. Uh, and the, the table actually breaks this out into um, manual vacuum, so you can go and run vacuum directly on the table, or if the auto vacuum daemon came in and, and did it automatically for you, and we have the timestamp for when that last happened too. So 
we've got options again. Uh, you can make auto vacuum happen uh, more more frequently for a table, or you can you know maybe set up a cron uh, outside of your uh, peak user hours that is just going to run vacuum against your tables that are getting updated heavily, and that's a good um, supplementary action that you can take if you know you've got some some outlier tables that might need to be vacuumed more. Uh, and then for checkpoint behavior, again, the log will tell us. Uh, you're you're going to see a theme here. There's a lot of good data in the PostgreSQL log. Uh, but so it'll log when checkpoints are being requested because the Red Hat log has reached its limit. Um, outside of the, the background process, it's going to issue checkpoints uh, normally. And then there's another table called PG Stat BG Writer. Uh, and that's going to have details on how many checkpoints have happened uh, that were requested by the system because the wall is full versus how many are happening um, due to that, that background checkpoint process that happens periodically. And so for checkpointing behavior, we wanna make sure we don't have those requested checkpoints. When you see a lot of requested checkpoint activity, that means that uh, you might have a, a scenario where um, you wanna tune the behavior and make it so that the checkpointing is happening only in the background process. And that's how we uh, make sure it's not getting in the way of query performance. So PG stat user table, PG stat BG writer uh, for, for people who are looking at how to monitor these processes. Sweet. So, okay, let's let's now take it to, I, I've, I've tuned the, or not I tuned, but I've configured kind of my system correctly. I, I, I think I have vacuuming enough times, you know, and now we're, now we're starting to look at actually at a, a workload in practice. Um, you know, how do we start looking at what queries and what should or shouldn't be indexed and anything along those lines? Yep. Um, if you're familiar with, with database performance management uh, in general, then the, the answers here are going to be pretty straightforward, pretty familiar. Um, query performance is heavily dependent on having a, a data model that maps well with your application as well as uh, good indexing for the, the schema that you've defined. So we really want to make sure that the uh, workload for our database is being continually monitored. Uh, we're finding queries that are expensive and making sure that they are using effective indexes. And if they're not, uh, potentially creating new indexes for them. And there are different data sources that Postgres has to help us with this, uh, as well as different indexes that you can create to uh, let the system work as efficiently as possible without you know, getting too crazy. Um, by default, Postgres is gonna create a, a B tree type index. That's kind of the um, standard version of, of an index in most databases. But it also has uh, things like hash indexes, which uh, are exceedingly good when you have queries that are doing lookups um, with you know, P equals value. Uh, we've got what are called GIN indexes, BRIN indexes, GIST indexes, uh, a bunch of others. And you can do things like uh, create indexes on expressions uh, rather than direct line columns, as well as create indexes that only apply to part of a table uh, as opposed to indexing everything in a table. So there's a lot of, of different ways that we can index our, our database workload and optimize for uh, you know, having indexes that take up space and are going to require uh, maintenance overhead for, again, those right operations like in inserts and updates. Uh, but also we wanna pay attention to the queries themselves. Uh, there's plenty of cases where you're going to run into queries that are expensive and yeah, maybe we can add an index that is going to make them more efficient, but there might also be a better way to write that query from the application's perspective. So that's something to keep in mind as well when we're, when we're monitoring performance. Uh, but on to, to how we go about doing that. Um, there's a bunch of different data sources that we can leverage to understand where expensive queries are coming from or whether or not our, our system is uh, using efficient indexes. So first and foremost, um, there's the PostgreSQL log. Uh, again, you're, you're seeing a theme here. Uh, you've got a couple different options for looking at expensive queries in the log. There's a option called log min duration statement. Um, this is going to set the minimum duration that a query has to run for uh, before it gets logged to the, uh, the log file. And Usually that'll be you know, some number of seconds. We don't want to log every single operation because that has performance implications of its own. Uh, and there's also a, a module in Postgres called auto explain. This is again for, for new versions. Um, so Ash mentioned earlier, we want to make sure we're on the latest version of Postgres. Otherwise you might not have uh, all the data available that you need for diagnostics. Um, but auto explain works very similar to the, the standard 
uh, slow query log min duration statement, you can tell the system to automatically issue and explain for queries that take longer than a certain, um, a certain duration. Instead, I'll let you find the expensive queries and automatically get the output of uh, Postgres equals explain to tell us, you know, what indexes are they using? How are they running? Why are they expensive uh, and slow running on the system? In addition to that, we've got uh, a few different tables that we can leverage. So PG stat activity will let us see in progress operations, what state they're in. Uh, are they blocked being in a lock? Are they uh, going ahead proceeding as normal? How long have they running for? Uh, how many operations we have running as the same table? Uh, all the things like this uh, kind of kind of questions can be answered by PG stat activity. There's also another extension called PG stat statements that'll let us collect statistics over time about which queries have run after they've completed. Uh, and it'll group them by fingerprints, uh, what they call digests, I think. And it'll show for each, for each query digest, how many times it's run, how long it's taken to run in total, uh, things like how much data is it reading out of the, the Postgres shared buffer? How much data does it have to read from outside the shared buffer? Uh, how long it takes for, for read and write activity and for the query to, uh, to take in total. So you can find queries that are causing lots of disk IO, queries that are not fitting inside our, uh, our in-memory cache, queries that are just running very, very frequently, and also just the generally the most time consuming queries. So we can go and get the explained data for them. Uh, either manually or by looking in the, the log using the auto explain module. Uh, I also included in, in my list here, uh, there's two tables, again, PG stat user tables and PG stat user indexes, which is similar. Uh, these will not tell us about queries themselves, but they will tell us about which tables are seeing sequential scans. So if the query runs and has to scan every row on the table, then that gets logged to uh, the, the PG stat user tables. Uh, view. And then we can also see which indexes are actually being used the most uh, in the PG stat user indexes table. So if we have indexes defined in our, our database and we want to see if they're being used effectively, we can see here on a table by table or an index by index basis. Uh, and that can help us identify areas where our, uh, our schema needs some more attention. We have sequential scans that are happening, or maybe we have some indexes that aren't being, as, being used as frequently as we'd expect. Sweet. So, so I, I, yeah, and and John, yeah. and and John, just that was awesome. Uh, and just, I, I just want to reiterate, you know, for newer people, uh, I just want to go back to the explain, uh, analyze uh, that explain plan, because it's really it's an uh, it's an incredible way to understand what's happening under the hood, uh, as far as you know, helping you tell how much data blocks came from disk and how many came from shared buffers uh, or your memory. So for example, if you're looking at an explain plan, you see shared read, that means uh, it came from disk and that data wasn't cached. But if you see shared hit uh, in your explain plan, then it came from memory. That's typically what you want. And also, as John mentioned, a sequential scan, if you see that typically means there's no index and Postgres had to fetch all of the data uh, from disk. So explain can be just a, an awesome tool uh, as well. Yep, definitely. One of the most important things to look at when you're trying to optimize queries, first thing you want to do is generally get an explain. Sweet. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is basically have you guys quickly walk through some products at, uh, you know, SolarWinds Solutions to show how this can make that job easier of finding those um, queries where, you know, what you need to index or what can be indexed. And basically, um, you know, we're well aware that any of this stuff can do, be done by hand, but it's just going to be cumbersome and, and take a lot of time. So, you know, really where there's the value of finding this data, having it bubble to the top, you know, uh, you know, finding the needle in the haystacks type thing. So with that said, I'm going to first turn it back over to John to uh, give a quick demo of Database Performance Monitor, AKA DPM. So John, uh, hopefully you can get share, screen share working and take it away for a little bit. Yeah, uh, are you able to see my you're screen good. here? Yep, you're good. Everything's working, I love it. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, so Database Performance Monitor or DPM uh, as we call it is a SaaS based platform that SolarWinds has for monitoring the performance of 
uh, databases like Postgres, as well as MySQL, MongoDB, Redis, uh, and Amazon Aurora. So what I've got pulled up on my screen here, we'll do a quick demonstration of how you can use DPM to understand how your query workload is changing. Uh, and we'll dive into a, a query and grab its explain plan. Uh, but really, it's, it's great to help with that continuous workload analysis that I mentioned uh, just before. If we want to see what queries are having the biggest impact on our, our databases, and as we go through and make changes like adding new indexes or changing our application and the way it's interacting with the database, we can easily keep track of what that's doing to performance. So right now I'm looking at what we call the profiler and it's showing me the top 20 most time consuming queries that have run in the last hour for my databases. Uh, I'm gonna quickly filter down from looking at all my systems to just my Postgres databases. We're keeping things relevant. And so this loads up, it'll show me just for the 15 out of 53 hosts in my data center that are running PostgreSQL. The demo gods are not looking friendly on you right now. <laughs> my having issues. I'm gonna play with my browser here for a second and see why I'm having trouble loading pages. Uh, and I'll switch things back over to, to Ash if you wanna talk about DPA for a little bit. Yeah, let's uh, oh, yeah. around real quick. How about a, a on the fly transition? <laughs> I know that oh. sounds good. <laughs> Okay, so let's um, let me know if you can. And John, uh, let me yeah. know when when things are good. You got me. Jared? Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So this is a product called DPA, uh, Database Performance Analyzer, is what the acronym uh, stands for. Uh, we love acronyms here at SolarWinds. This used to be a product called Confio Ignite. Um, and then it was acquired back in October 2013 and then rebranded to be Database Performance Analyzer. What you're looking at here is just the main dashboard of DPA. So DPA is what I would like to refer to as a response time analysis tool. It monitors and records user active sessions every second. And then it embraces a concept called weight-based analytics. Uh, and in order to do that, the platforms that it supports have to have weight instrumentation. Uh, solar, SolarWinds Postgres added uh, weight instrumentation in version 9.6. Uh, there are some platforms, if you're familiar with EDB, uh, its compatibility uh, version, its Oracle compatibility layer, uh, the Enterprise Edition actually had weight instrumentation uh, prior to 9.6 via DITRA. Um, and DPA does support those. So it supports multiple, monitoring multiple database platforms. Uh, it really gives you a great, great insight into the actual workload from a cumulative response time perspective. So that's what you're looking at here, kind of your top five, you know, busiest instances. It keeps track of trending patterns. It has out of the box uh, machine learning algorithms to let you know if there's a performance uh, anomaly. It's analyzing the data. It's looking for anything that's detrimental from a database, from a query perspective. Uh, and I'm gonna dive into Postgres uh, here in our demo site. I'm just gonna dive into this one. So the first thing you're going to notice are your top 15 queries based on cumulative wait time. So this is a 30-day snapshot uh, of your queries. Uh, the colored slices represent one of the queries on the right-hand side, and you can kind of hover over so you can sort of see a snapshot. But what's really cool is you'll notice up above, we have different dimensions. So we can look at the performance if you have multiple applications. Are they behaving well? Multiple databases. You can look at the resp response time of those users, hosts. Uh, et cetera, including uh, the weights kind of from a 10,000 foot view. Uh, below your performance of your queries, uh, you'll also see these correlation tabs. And I sort of want to spend a little bit of time on resources with the Postgres platform. And we talked about configuration and we talked about checkpointing, uh, vacuuming, all of that good stuff. Um, what we've added here with Postgres from a resource perspective. So not only can you correlate performance, and then maybe you have some buffer cache hit ratio. How often is data being read, read from cache versus a uh, disk? Uh, what are your TPSs, transactions per second? The activity that's going on, you can correlate uh, all those things. Then we added some additional metrics specific to Postgres so you can really understand your workload when you're configuring 
because that's really going to determine uh, what you do, including looking at particular uh, metrics related to vacuum health, particular metrics related to checkpoint health, replication, and even uh, your cash and cash eviction. Uh, and we could use a whole nother session <laughs> to really dive into that. So what's great is I can very quickly then see uh, not only my trending queries, but then I can look at uh, kind of what is the average execution time uh, of a given query as well. And then I can quickly uh, dive in uh, to really understand what that workload is and what's going on. And so now I can drill into a particular day. I can look at my top queries from a performance perspective. I can correlate different metrics. So I can look at my checkpoint health, my disk health. So maybe I have uh, you know, my buffer cash hit ratio. Uh, Data is getting flushed from cash. Uh, then I may want to take a look at my disk performance to see what's going on. So I can really put a, a great story together for overall performance. What's also great about DPA is as you dive in, and I'm going to switch over to another instance here, you can dive into a particular query, see all the statistics, and then you can also run a live plan and look at the explain plan as well. And you can even do this uh, real time. So it's a great, great product for just understanding your workload, not only historically, uh, but as it's currently being run. You can also annotate any changes that are uh, occurring or that have happened in your environment as well. Um, so in the home, for example, if I drill into a particular instance here, I'll go into Postgres again, uh, we'll go into Windows. So you can see this annotate. So maybe you change the configuration. You can even set up alerts if your ch configuration changed uh, and be notified as well. But it's just a great way to understand that workflow to get optimal uh, performance. John, are you, how are you doing? Yep, I'm, I'm good to go. Of course, the moment okay. that, uh, that we switched over, it works because as Jared of mentioned, course. the demo burned me today. There we go. Well, I'm going to stop sharing and and then you can go. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. <laughs> so hopefully that's showing up for everyone. Uh, what we're looking at here yeah. in, in DPM, uh, and again, to recap, a uh, SaaS-based platform for monitoring uh, database performance over time. So I've got the, the top 20 most time-consuming queries that I've run against my, my Postgres databases, just for recent history, the last hour of activity. And I can see which ones are, are taking the most time in aggregate, the expensive queries that I might want to uh, look at either modifying the query or modifying the, the database schema to improve performance. And what we can do in, in DPM is rank our workload by a lot of different dimensions to understand which queries might be expensive for different reasons. So if I expand this filter bar at the top, I've got the ability to look at things like uh, which queries are running most frequently against my database or spend the most time reading data from uh, outside of the, the Postgres shared buffer cache or which uh, queries are spending the most time writing data to disk. Uh, mm -hmm. Queries that are uh, having the largest number of uh, in-cache hits. So we're seeing you know, data being read, it's within the shared buffer cache, but it might be reading too much data even if it can fit in memory. Or again, which ones are uh, simultaneously causing queries that have uh, causing reads from outside the cache? Uh, which queries are causing temp data operations? Going back and thinking about that work mem parameter we talked about at the beginning. Uh, a lot of different ways to, to slice and dice here and see uh, particular queries that have particular behavior. I can also take a look at whether or not things have changed significantly after I make a change to my my database or my application. Uh, so I can really easily compare against historical time periods. So if I want to see, for example, an hour over hour comparison, maybe I just made a change to my database. I can see uh, for each query, the most recent activity, as well as one hour previous. Uh, and it's easy for me to sort this and find the ones that have the largest, say, increase in, uh, in behavior. And from here, we can click on a statement, dive into its behavior, and see which servers in my data center are seeing traffic from this query. Of my 15 servers, only one is actually seeing this uh, select statement that we're looking at. Uh, and I have a lot of tags that you see here that show me data about where this query is coming from. So um, which logical database it's uh, being run against, which user is issuing the query. Uh, I've got a, a custom one that shows me the application that's running this query. Uh, and we can use these tags that are defined to filter and see 
uh, other common areas of the workload related to this database. So I can take this app equals guestbook tab and uh, use it to filter in the profiler and find all the queries that are, are running from the guestbook app. Uh, the other really cool thing that we can do here, looking at uh, the details for this statement, is I can dig into sample executions. Uh, each one of these red dots that you see here is a sample that I can select. And that'll show me what this query actually looks like, details about the connection that ran this instance of the statement, how long this particular query took to run. So this one took 16.97 seconds. Uh, and we have the explain plan available. So here's a, a basic tabular output that shows me I'm doing a sequential scan against the, the guest book table. Uh, and I see it was about 984,000 rows. Uh, and here's the, the cost estimate that the query optimizer used for this query. I can also see the raw JSON that comes back from the database as well. And this has even more detail about what's going on uh, when Postgres runs this query. So as a, uh, an engineer or a, a DDA that's looking at uh, my, my database performance, this is the first place I want to go in order to understand what is this query doing and how can I potentially make it faster running against the, the database. Uh, so you have access to how your workload is changing and details information about where queries are coming from and how they're behaving within DPM. And you can look at this data for a particular server. I can put one server under the microscope and look at uh, whether or not it is behaving correctly uh, or if its behavior has changed. I can also look at my entire data center at once. So if you're using a lot of smaller database instances, uh, maybe you've got many different apps, each one has its own Postgres instance, we can stay on top of all of them uh, in one central view and then filter based on you know, which instance I want to look at or which application uh, I want to look at using the tagging behavior. Uh, in addition to the query workload metrics, uh, we do also have things like best practices to help understand whether or not your Postgres servers are configured properly. So if you're not using a managed service like uh, Amazon RDS, uh, where they're going to configure things out of the box for you, this is a great way to make sure that, say, your, your uh, on-premise systems are uh, following the, the best practices that we laid out in this webinar and more. Uh, so you can see things like whether or not shared buffers is uh, being configured correctly for, for the system or other things like the wall buffers, effective cache size, maintenance work memory, uh, including things like uh, idle transaction timeout. We didn't address this directly in the, the webinar, but uh, I think Ash did mention earlier, having long running transactions can severely impact performance. And so DPM will check uh, all the configuration options like this that are going to have a, a big impact potentially on your system's performance and recommend which ones should be changed, uh, as well as some recommendations about the queries themselves that are running against your system. So you've got some immediately actionable advice that you can, can use to help tune your system, as well as views to help you keep track of how the workload is changing and continuously keep tabs on what your applications are doing that are having the biggest impact on your database's performance. And I think we're running right up against the, the end of our time. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've so I'll sort of hit up on the uh, thing real quick. So I'm going to kind of just skip ahead. Uh, what I'm going to do is we've got uh, one more poll question. Actually, two more poll questions real quick is if you'd like to get a, a DPM pricing um, or schedule a demo with the sales engineer, definitely this is where you can do elongated uh, demo and, and kind of see possibly how this would work in your environment, ask some more technical questions, anything like that. Um, and then we also have the next one coming up for, um, uh, let's see what's the next, do, 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 uh, DPA as well. So basically, again, uh, if you want us to contact and work with you and see if this is a good solution for you. Um, with that said, uh, what I'd like to do is actually announce the winner. Uh, I'm doing it a little bit early in case uh, somebody has to go. Is is Corey Lehman of Pennsylvania? You have been selected as the winner of the $300 Amazon gift card from Actual Tech Media. Uh, they will reach out to you to um, to figure out how to get you that. Um, and then there were some Q and A real quick. So if we can knock those out. Um, there was a question coming in about what version of Postgres are we talking about? Um, I guess during our slide, I, I, I'm unaware if there was if certain features came in certain versions, so, or if these are all the versions or newer than version X. So um, if you have any of that information, John and Ash, that would be great. Yeah, the, so it really depends on the different areas. So 
So there isn't a, an easy answer for that. I think you almost have to look at the releases and what came out. So for example, you know, 9.1, they introduced the auto-tune uh, feature, but they're continually coming out with different, um, different features as they relate uh, to these areas, even how they changed how memory was used before you had to really focus on the Linux kernel and its buffer, you know, but then they changed that in one of the releases. So there's too many to note here, uh, but that's just, I guess the, what I want to hammer home is, you know, spend some time looking at those various areas. And before you change that configuration, do some research. Uh, I have to say postgres.org um, has some great uh, documentation and it does a really good job kind of addressing those versioning questions uh, for whatever area you're going to be looking in. Yeah. And I think that everything we discussed in the, the webcast today will apply to all the non end of life versions of Postgres. If you're using one older than that, then uh, you may find that some of the information that we're talking about here is not going to apply to your system. But as Ash mentioned, the, the Postgres SQL docs uh, website will, will give you information specific to your version. Cool, cool. Hey, uh, real quick, I went back to the, uh, did you want a DPM or a contact DPM slot? Apparently I tabbed through that too quick. I didn't realize it took the option away from people. So I went back to that. Um, another question that came in, are the slides available after the presentation? Yes, they will be. Um, with auto vacuum daemon, is it necessary to run analyze manually? Um, you shouldn't have to if your system is, is configured to, to work with vacuum nicely uh, as is. Um, you may want to run vacuum or vacuum analyze manually in addition to the auto vacuum daemon though for specific tables. Uh, in particular, if you add an index to your your table and you look at queries, uh, explain plans and see they're doing sequential scans when they should be using an index, then that's a telltale sign that you need to run analyze more frequently. Uh, and so you can either tune the, the auto vacuum daemon. Uh, it's got settings specific to, to how frequently analyzes tables, uh, which we didn't really get into in this, this webcast, uh, or you can just do it manually uh, again on a cron job or something like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, all right, there's another one came in. Um, I may have missed this, but how does this compare performance-wise to my SQL? Um, I don't know. Ooh. <laughs> Quite the contentious topic. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that Postgres performance and MySQL performance are um, they're hard to explicitly say one is better than another one. There are definitely scenarios in which Postgres will outperform MySQL. Uh, Similarly, there are scenarios where MySQL can outperform Postgres. At the end of the day, what really is going to matter is uh, how your application's data model is set up and making sure that you haven't missed some of the you know, foundational configuration for the database more than the technology itself. Um, if you're more comfortable with one than the other, I would recommend picking the one you're comfortable with uh, because you can do pretty much everything in one that you can in the other. Yeah, and just to add to that, usually when I hear MySQL is more performant than Postgres, it usually means Postgres hasn't been tuned yeah, so just want to put, point that out. Uh, I'm a little biased, <laughs> but out of the <laughs> out of the box, um, I mean, Postgres definitely has to be tuned based on application workload. Yep. Um, and then there was another question that came in: Is will SolarWinds be using this tool against its own SolarWinds NetFlow NCM and uh, NPM database? Um, I mean, Ash, you can talk about it from a sales engineering perspective, but I, I mean, I, I know even from a product marketing perspective that we have obviously uh, the Orion products run on Microsoft SQL. And I know we have um, on more than one instance used DPA to ensure that things were looking good from a database point of view on a, you know, usually large Orion instance, multiple products. Um, but I don't know if you want to speak to that real quick from a, SE point of view, if you've seen that before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, uh, they'll use DPA pointed to uh, Ryan database to make sure everything is uh, performing as expected, uh, you know, pointing out any, any issues that you want to focus on. Um, you know, it doesn't feel good because it's pointing at us <laughs> a lot of times. But I also want to point out that um, DPA does, it didn't cover the architecture, but DPA has its, it, it would be put in its own environment. Um, it also integrates uh, with Orion, but DP is a Java application, so you can install it on Windows, Unix, Linux. You can deploy it um, 
you know, and on any operating system that supports uh, Java, basically, and it has its own repository, so it it runs as its own standalone product, but it can integrate with Orion, which then gives you the ability to pull in metrics from all those different modules and correlate everything, which is kind of cool. But yeah, I have seen that uh, done, Jared. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it typically is on the large, large installs, thousands, tens of thousands of endpoints pulling in, you know, millions of metrics. So um, with that said, uh, we've got a couple of links here that you could learn more about the products. Obviously, um, as Ash was just saying, they do cover more than just uh, Postgres. So if you wanted to see MySQL and Postgres side by side and see them in your environment and which one's performing better, um, or SQL and Oracle or Mongo and Redis or anybody pretty much in between, we've got you covered. Um, again, allowing you to do migrations, allowing you to see performance of a single database type, anything along those lines, you can really use this product to, you know, uh, right size your database or, you know, tune your database, things along those lines. Um, I'll give everybody one more second. I know we ran a little bit over. I apologize about that. Um, but uh, again, thank you. Uh, and I've already answered the uh, Amazon gift card question. So with that said, I'm going to turn it back over to David so we can end the uh, webcast. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Great job. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.